Welcome to One Way to Machines and the B7 Audi RS4 series. Here we've got one full jug and two empties from before. The car took two full jugs in the previous part of the series and it is still only just above minimum. It still needs more. I don't know the size of my oil cooler but mine looks like a stock set wrap unit. So really keep an eye on your oil level at the beginning if you've done a service like I did in the 8 part series. Although the low oil level sensor will save you but these are sensitive cars and built to precise specs. You don't want to mess around with this. So use a div stick, spend time and a couple drive cycles and cool downs. Then check on level ground the oil and continue to fill as much as you need. Make sure to do this before the low oil light ever comes on. There's lots of nooks and crannies in this engine and you will have an emptied oil cooler to a degree if you did the oil cooler o-rings for the secondary oil cooler. This full bottle of TRW brake fluid is what we're going to use in an upcoming hopeful clutch fluid swap video. Now let's take a quick intake manifold detour. We're going to be revisiting the plugs on the side of the intake manifold right now. So in there. Go and watch the intake manifold carbon clean videos as I show this a little bit better. Actually I think I posted it on a thread online. The exact pictures so maybe in a future intake manifold video I'll show exactly how deep every single one on this particular engine ended up sitting after I was done with it. But what I'm going to say here is this tool from one of the aftermarket manufacturers is a good tool for beginners okay if you're really not too confident in your skills but even with this and only 2000 grit light sanding the holes inside the intake manifold some of my plugs sat much further than out so you might want to get a new set of plugs from one of the aftermarket people if you're going to use this tool but if you're going to use the old ones it's going to require a specific touch and you better put that red loctite on well and clean so I did use it but I probably wouldn't use it again I am more of a fan of using a traditional punch at this point now this is the only one I have in the garage of what you want ideally is for the end to be much thicker and round like the aftermarket tool you see that because when you punch in there you got to have a lot of precision to seat that properly because it's friction fit and you don't want it to go in sideways especially if you put your red loctite on not that it can't be redone you can even do it with a punch like this but if you have a punch that is closer in diameter to this end you will definitely have a better result but it's just a feel thing you get it in about halfway and then wait for your loctite to dry so now we're going to be looking at these bolts here okay the bolts holding on the intake manifold, you can reuse them. I've reused them a number of times, but just because if you guys remember the one bolt I broke at the back because I torqued it to spec, which I'll never do again if I'm reusing old bolts, snugging is the correct way for me. Those bolts, replace them, okay? Buy them at the dealer and replace them because you're gonna be taking this manifold on and off a whole bunch of times. I'd say two to three uses max with somebody that has a really good touch on those bolts. Although they could probably go 10 to 15 uses, not a risk I would take on a car like this. So for those of you that remember, that bolt there still needs to be dealt with. Moving further back, okay, I can't videotape it for you guys, but I'm gonna insert a picture that's going to show you an alternate route to the early days, okay? When I was getting advice from an experienced person the first time I did the carbon clean, I did the coolant bypass mod, which is a popular forum way of doing it. There is, in a way, more advanced, but still the old style is my preference. So for those of you that have watched the carbon clean series, you can you will remember that I completely cut the hose in the middle, we joined it together and bypassed it. There's another way, there's a kit that puts two caps to stop the coolant flow altogether and it keeps going. That small coolant passageway I think is way overrated in the entire pressure of the cooling system, but other nerds would probably argue that, okay? 
So I didn't do the, the cap style. I did the style where we joined it and went on the side. Now the reason that that picture, I'm gonna insert it once or twice here when I'm editing, you'll see it. But the other way to do it to not have to cut that coolant hose, there is one T30 or T25 bolt from the back that you can see in my intake manifold series when you go back there, okay? There is a silver piece that connects to the intake manifold and it's a very hard to get bolt High chance of dropping it down in the back. But the beauty of that one is you just pop that piece that comes through the PCV. So it comes from the PCV and then it goes into the intake manifold. If you just push that back, you can remove this without ever having to touch any of those coolant hoses. And then you just push it back in and use a bolt. Now, you should silicone grease it and put it back because there's an O-ring on it. I don't like that method because that O-ring could tear when you put it back in, could cause a vacuum leak, probably you'll be fine. And if you're doing it too many times like that, you'll probably have to buy an O-ring from the dealer, which could be a hassle for that one piece back there. They most likely sell it separate from the intake manifold. So I just want to tell you that there is another way to do that and you won't have to touch any of the coolant hoses. But my ultimate final is most likely going to be silicon hoses that go all the way to the side of the intake manifold and out because I really don't care for the, the way they designed the coolant passage to go through there to warm PCV air and whatnot. But hey, there's a lot of stuff on this car that people have different opinions on. I'm just mentioning to you guys that if you do not want to cut that hose and put a coupler in it, there is a way to do it from the back. So that split hose, the EVAP hose under the intake manifold that I showed way back, maybe over a year ago in that intake manifold video, it still hasn't leaked so we haven't touched it, but when this comes off that's definitely going to get replaced, don't think I forgot about that. And the next time this intake manifold comes off I will be using all new bolts. So for this clip we go back to the water pump area. Now I probably mentioned it in those series and don't mind that, that's just some water because I went out in the snow and came back, it's not a leak. The water pump, I inserted the hex shaft first when it popped out and then I put the water pump onto it and clipped it in. You can go watch that whole series, it's a, a long one. But the point is, you would think that maybe if you can get the hex shaft onto the water pump and shove it all the way in and wiggle your way, that'd be a better way. The only problem that I could really see from that when I thought about it a bit is it runs through the power steering pump too. So if you were to, by some chance, okay, if you don't do it the way that I did it, if you get it halfway in and you rotate that hex shaft for some reason, people do all kinds of crazy stuff in their own DIY land, you might misalign that hex that goes all the way through to the oil pump side that comes all the way to the water pump, okay? So you want all three of those to be aligned. And if for some reason you misalign the water pump on your way in when you're playing with stuff and you can't get it onto that oil pump, it could just become more difficult. Not that anything drastic could happen, it's just you might run into another roadblock that you couldn't see. I might be totally wrong about it, but I'm just thinking ahead for some of you that think you're going to try to do it a different way. The most common way these HPFPs fail is from fuel around that connector and you have to buy the whole thing. Now. The reason I brought some focus onto the HPFP again is if you guys remember there was a weird sound coming after the putback series from this area and even today right now after the video I just posted I opened the door once and it made a little screech sound from this side. Now I can't pinpoint where it's coming from but this, this area of fueling system is still under investigation of sound. Welcome to Audi land. And it only does it the first time you open the door when the car is really cold. Some kind of sound coming from around here. So we just have to keep an eye on these things until we figure them out. In terms of the coolant reservoir, I'm pretty sure I've shown in a previous video the bulges and the cracking on it. I'm really not a fan of what I did by putting this back on, but I wanted to get the video series out and keep going on with stuff. But that's such an easy swap that when I get a chance, I'm going to buy one probably from the dealer and just put it on there. That's not a good thing to run with, you know what I mean? It's it's not that it won't detect a leak, It'll if it leaks it'll give you a sensor thing, but do you really want to be on the road and because of something as silly as that, have to get a tow truck? 
Going back to the putback series, this is something I knew I was doing wrong at the time, but I was just in the zone to finish that job, so I went with what I could find. This is always inside of my dirt bike toolbox, okay, that I take with myself when I have the trailer and the dirt bike. This is for, for cracking the lug nuts loose on my trailer if I get a flat. But that's one thing, this is a tool that was hiding from me for a long time. But this is very crucial for those of you doing work on this car because, I mean, my method is my method being alone the way I did the belt tensioner. But you never want to use something ratcheting on serious pull braking stuff. Sorry, serious force bolts or springs and stuff like that, okay? You guys saw I bent that ratchet from here, putting the spring down for the belt tensioner on this car. It's a hefty tension that that spring needs. This is the correct tool, okay? And even in service position and as low as my car was, this would have worked perfectly, okay? The reason you use this is it's literally a mini breaker bar that has a 3 8 end. And you want a 3 8 end because that goes right into the belt tensioner on the RS4. No matter what you hook up to this, it's not going to bend or break or see, I got lucky with the, my gears would skip sometimes, okay? I skipped, I don't know, some of the attempts maybe I didn't show there because the, it didn't break the gear in that 3 8 I eventually used it, but it can skip a gear because of the amount of force it needs. So, this is the correct tool to use on an RS4 belt job. Do not do this. But if you really want to, they're cheap, inexpensive. If you break them like me, who cares? You can do that too. If you haven't already watched it, in Carbon Clean Part 7, I talk about a vacuum line in this area. P2404, if I'm not mistaken, was the code that we had at some point. There was a, Maybe that was an EVAP code. There was issues with the SAI system at some point. I have to go back and watch all my codes videos and figure out exactly what happened at what time frame. But the point here is I'm pretty sure that vacuum line helped solve a problem with the SAI intermittent function that we've had in previous videos in the past past of this series. Because that vacuum line I mean, we'll go over the circuitry of the vacuum circuitry. I mean, the way the vacuum flows at some point, but the that vacuum line comes out into the double T nipple joint and it goes all the way down to the SAI pump area. Okay, could also go through to the air box flap area. They're very interconnected, but all I want to say is that 2404 code, sorry. Okay, maybe it's better I don't talk about this, but 2404 SAI, okay. SAI is what I think that vacuum line helped with. I won't talk about it until I do my research and I'll make a video, research on my own videos and clarify that one. Again, even that one, my final sequence of events, it could be a total guess. So just plug in that vacuum line and don't have problems. Let's quickly revisit the belt tensioner, okay? If you put a reducer on a big breaker bar, on a lift, obviously use that because you can have a low strength person help you. And even and if you have the whole front clip removed, just use a big breaker bar because you have range of motion. Okay, the big problem while you use the little one is because you don't have range of motion when you are doing that. So the small one might be fine, but if you really have a weak helper, just put a 3 8 adapter, a quality one on there and try to use that. But the middle tool is still the go-to. And going back to that EVAP line down there that was cracked but passed the cigarette smoke test that I did way back when. We haven't changed that, but that's still on the menu. I know I mentioned it, but I'm mentioning it one more time. The point of mentioning it again is to drive the point home that that hose is not leaking even though it's cracked. We're still going to get to the seat carpets that I said we'd talk about later. But I also want to say I did kind of diss and say some carpet engineer who wanted a bigger role in things. But the idea behind this most likely was so that sound from the rear fender wells does not come into the cabin. And the more of this material you have that is a solid one piece, the less rocks hitting the inside of the fender are going to travel into the car. So some credit to that guy. So I do think that that design is for sound deadening, obviously not for ease of work, but we are still going to cut that off. I'll mention this again in the next video or the video we do for that. In the video where I talk about my jack stands or blocks for storage, I did make one comment about C63s or M3s being crap. 
Now, I didn't specify too much because I'm just talking when I make the videos, but all I meant was C63s and M3s would be crap in the snow, okay? Which is why I said you keep them away in your garage anyways. Didn't mean they're crap. We're going to have cars of those variants on the channel. Just meant that they'll probably be crap in the snow so that you fanboys don't run away for other brands. Some more carbon clean revisions. So there's the throttle body and the one fuel pressure pump. We're gonna go inside here. You see there's two engine lifting eyelets, okay? One at the front and the back. Those are actually triple squares. I say you should use a T50. A T50 works just fine, but over repeated use, especially if you have rust, you don't want to damage those bolts. So take that correction and use the correct size triple square. And remember, it's only the bolt that comes out, not the entire mounting bracket. So the other one is hiding back here and you just need to remove the bolts. I mean, go back to the Carbon Clean series to get the exact information on that, but just thought I'd mention that. One more thing I'm gonna mention is the fuel clips in that area. I got things on nice and properly, but I don't think I installed them perfectly the last time, okay? When I'm removing them, those are correct because I took pictures the first time I did it before I made the Carbon Clean series video. So the takeaway from here is before I look into that more, everything is fine on my car, but even be wary of all of the places that I have fuel clips. Like I said, most likely on when I remove them, we're talking about the fuel clips in this entire area, okay? These are some of the most difficult parts and you're gonna be very tired at the end of the carbon clean when you're putting these on. Take pictures, take pictures, surf online, find exactly where they all go if you've lost it and your car was not put together properly, but I thought I'd mention that. My car's fine, but those fuel clips are very sensitive, tough to put on. Make sure they're in the right spot. I can't repeat that enough. So just a quick repeat, if you've opened the oil cooler O-rings, you may as well have three jugs of oil ready. You can use it next time if you don't use it this time, but you may need it to be topped up on your oil properly. Let's talk about carbon cleaning for people who are less confident in their skills, okay? Putting the car in service position will give you more space at the front of the intake manifold to deal with all the sensitive stuff there although it can 100% be done without service position. And the other thing, okay, this is another revision that again, I am not really a fan of. I mean, if you have a lift, it's probably way easier to do this in limited space, but 99% of you don't have a shop. So the pushing the car forward thing, I like that I do in the first part of the series. Now you can get a tool for the actual, to turn the motor over but it's expensive and most of you don't have it. One trick that people use is they use the alternator bolt and you can access it when the car is not in service position to turn the motor over, but sometimes the belt may slip and you're gonna have to pull the belt and turn it at the same time and you're gonna have to keep coming back up to check. So that could be tough, especially if your car's on the floor and it's not jacked up, which most of you won't be for the carbon clean, but if you have it lifted up, that is something that you can do instead of pulling the car forward to close the second set of valves. Again, for even more novices, doing that alternator rotating thing with the belt to move the motor over, you're gonna have even more space in service position. So service position can help for carbon cleans for novices, but you better be ready to turn it from the alternator and be confident that your belt and everything is going to move, or you can get the tool and go right on the motor and then you'll definitely be able to turn it. I highly advise though, you get your skills mastered on Japanese cars or lesser Audis, Mercs and BMWs, before you do this because you really don't need service position and everything else because what that does is it allows more sloppiness to occur if you're not careful but also it doesn't. The only other advantage is I would say if you're careful for your knees not to damage any of the coolers on the front you won't have the bumper in your way so when you're going into the back there it might be a little bit easier to reach but each one has its pros and cons if you can just do it the way I've done it in the original series, but think about it for yourself and maybe do it the other way. So I'm no expert on electronics and how they go bad and how they don't, but I will tell you from experience, say in Volvo land, 
because those cars can get bricked with electronic modules that have to speak to each other, which is no different than this. There's a lot of German-made electronics on Volvos, okay? But what I'm trying to say is one thing you should look out for always. Say that, that uh, vacuum solenoid we just changed right here in the front, okay? I don't have it out here right now and I'm not pulling a bunch of stuff to shine lights on it, but that was labeled 2015. That has sat in a, on a shelf for seven or eight years before I used it because the place that I got it from was not an Audi specialist parts place, okay? And God knows what local parts place they had with that part on their shelf. And you guys even remember the vacuum lines on it, but I won't get off topic. But the point is, when I went to the Audi dealership, when we did change the potentiometer that wasn't the issue on this car, that was labeled 2022. So your chances of getting an electronic component that is newer from the dealer are higher. Again, this stuff, electronics, that's why I like mechanical cars because no one can give you the final answer on how the electronics fail specifically always, circuit board, stuff like that. Everything fails differently. There's the electrical engineering part is part swapping in the end, finding, is it the circuit board, is it this, the module and you just swap it out. So what happens here is you could have a 2022 sensor that goes bad before it's 2015 for some reason. Like I said, I've seen Volvos fail a certain component way back when these cars were new, almost under warranty, and then it doesn't happen to a car for 15 years. But still, I mean, using just basic logic, which still might be incorrect, I don't like that that sensor I put in was from 2015. I would have preferred buying it from the dealer or an Audi specialist with the date stamp and having the electronic sensor being as new as possible. Again, this is just guessing. Take your own gamble with it. But I wouldn't buy from that part supplier again for electronic components for this car or any of my other European... I'm not going to diss these cars so the fanboys don't get sad. Electronics-wise. Now, speaking about that same sensor there, there's another exact one of those vacuum solenoids down here near the airbox. I can't remember if it helps control the SAI or the airbox flapper, but the way you saw that fail, this one here could too. So if you are down here and you've got the whole front end off, I couldn't even find it the other day when I just looked. I'm going to have to go look back and see exactly where it is, but think about changing that if you have a problem too, because that part is designed to fail in my opinion. I mean, days after I posted that video when I figured out the EPC light. I saw a video of this newer German channel that the guy is doing carbon cleans on RS4s and working on them. And the guy doesn't show it, but in a quick clip, he shows that vacuum solenoid and the EPC light on the RS4 from an angle through the passenger seat. And it is identically failed to the one that I have with the rust and where the cracks are on it. So, I tell you guys what happened, but that guy wants to get the services, so... But but the point is, that video illustrates, it's a second point, that they do fail like that. That's a common thing for it to happen. And, in one of the previous videos, someone said that they also... That helped them solve their EPC light. So this could be a very common sensor. Just repeating, there are at least two of them. One there, one down here somewhere which we will get into in a later video. And yeah, I think it has to do with the airbox flapper, but I won't go rambling on for now. We'll get the correct answer in a future video. So for the seat carpet thing, I'm not gonna take mine back out, but here's how I would do it if I took the rear seats out next. When we cut them, okay, for ease of service, if it was for sound deadening, this solidity of this piece, what I would do is make my cut in a place and sandwich the piece of carpet back in if I can somehow. But that could be very optimistic thinking with the difficulty I had to put the rear seats in. So we'll leave that as a ramble point. I'll keep the clip in and we'll see what we end up doing. I'm going to insert another picture I took before I put the car back yesterday together. But for the solenoid here, I think with the key word being, I think it's a very tight but I don't even think you need to put the car in service position if the solenoid is your only problem, okay? You just need to take off the carbon cover and the bracket for it, possibly. You're going to have a really tough time, I think, with the vacuum lines under the solenoid. And the, 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 the reason I say I think is the 
bank one potentiometer I think is going to be in your way. Okay, so I looked at it. I are obviously did it in service position because it was a secondary step to the potentiometer for me. I still recommend service position, but I just wanted to mention you might, might be able to do that one with everything still intact on the car. If it works for you, it does. If not, put it in the service position, but don't drop your tools in there. So just yesterday when I was putting the car back, you have those two crash struts with the three bolts and the one 10 millimeter nut on both sides there. Before I used the floor jack to raise it up, that's still a great way to do it. But this time I was so tired, I even completely forgot about doing that. And I had a really hard time aligning everything, okay, from doing the two bolts at the top on both sides and those three. But the thing is, I did it without the floor jack this time. And those bolts, the three, are tapered at the end. So even if you're slightly off, you can get them in there, but have a very good DIY mechanics touch so that you don't strip those bolts going in. You can get away with it without a floor jack is what I'm trying to say, but if you can and that cross member at the bottom is still intact, use a floor jack or have someone hold it up slightly for you to do both sides. Just wanted to mention that I did it without a floor jack this time. Still not my preference to do it without a floor jack. Well, the car's back together now, but if you guys remember, there's a hard oil cooler line there that was just touching, sorry, I think it was a power, you know, it was an oil cooler line that was touching a power steering bracket or something. There's a million things up there, I can't remember. But I came to slide those bolts on the adjustment out, and it ended up not wanting to budge. And I was like, yo, I'm not going to damage something else on this stint, and it was barely touching, so I just want to let you guys know I didn't do anything about that. And it wasn't that bad. So before you come to loosen those two uh, adjustment bolts there, which they are, realize that they may be connected much at hard points on both sides. And you really got to look into it before you start pulling stuff in and out. But that was so minor and I was nitpicking. So I just left it and put the car back together. Back to the vacuum solenoid in this area. I said in that previous video that I don't think it's a common fault. But the more I've been looking... I, I just mentioned the video I saw and one person that mentioned it. I do think it's a common fault. Look at it. But again, I mean, there's also threads that somebody solved it with the potentiometer on the bank that they were getting the code for. So the way that sensor failed, the fact that I saw another sensor fail in the exact same way in a video like I told you previously in this video, that is what makes me think it's a common fault because the chances of that car in Germany having gone through the exact same life as this in terms of salt and water going through the grill is not that plausible. Okay, it's probably the sensor designed to fail in a way, probably internally. And it was cracked on the exact same spots. Okay, I won't go on about that too much more. So this is the area where your belt is. This is a quick tip for those carbon clean people who are thinking of using the alternator to rotate the engine. The one thing you also want to keep in mind is that is an advanced thing to move it from the alternator if your belt starts to slip because you don't want to stress your belt incorrectly either. I mean, which means if is if you're a novice and you grab onto the belt and you move it off of its pulleys or whatever, you could possibly cause damage when you turn it on if you're not paying attention or cause damage in the process of doing that. But if you're careful, you should be fine. The person I bought these from was very knowledgeable on oils, Audis, and VWs. And what I'm gonna tell you is really interesting. The VW Audi approved oil is actually thinner for fuel consumption, okay? And it can leak more into your oil on cold start and cause more puffs out the back. It is just thinner for fuel efficiency and EPA stuff. Now, the main thing is Synth Oil Premium, at a quick glance, you might think, yeah, this is VW Audi approved, but it's not. When you look carefully, it's VW Audi recommended by Liqui Moly. And the person told me this stuff is thicker, which is why I'm most likely not getting my puff of smoke out the back. And we'll see how this does in terms of oil burning. So this stuff being thicker is my preference. That person also said Molly Gen is the way they would go. But Molly Gen is just a bit too expensive and we're going to try this because we're going to be doing low oil change intervals anyway. So 5W50 might not be necessary. This stuff is more than thick enough and I prefer it to the VW Audi approved Liqui Moly 540 for this car. 
but this is going to be a test in itself that I didn't see coming, but we will continue with the Synthoil Premium on this RS4 and see how it does. Now, if you'll remember, I had Motul in this car, so let's not diss Motul. I had said that the Motul burned a lot, there was puffs of smoke, it burned oil, it just wasn't very good. That was VW Audi approved Motul, because it was from the same place, okay? And the stuff that Motul has, which is thicker actual race oils, are very expensive. So Liquimali, I still do recommend for these cars. Which one you want to use? Use MollyGen if you feel like spending a few extra bucks because it has more additives and whatnot. But I think this stuff for the short oil change intervals that I'm going to do from now on due to what I saw in previous parts of the series. If you haven't seen it, go read up on fuel dilution for RS4s. There's a lot of talk from back in the day, old school members talking about it. And in my own videos, I have literally seen it and smelled it. So go watch those videos. We will see what happens and this is going to be swapped out very quickly anyways by me so we'll see just look forward to my style of doing it and then make your own choices again that person also they do tuning and stuff they said that this synth oil stuff is really good okay the thickness the additives everything this is a great choice i always talk about hard resets and capacitor drains i've heard different things from all kinds of professionals I don't know how long it takes to drain all the capacitors, but brake, putting, pushing the brake pedal could work on some cars. We'll look into that further to see if it's true for all cars. And the other thing is with the yellow connectors, SRS connectors. Now, I don't know if somebody spoke to me indirectly that these cars have a second battery that most cars have a second battery for the SRS system so that it functions. But I'm thinking because a capacitor is, overall a battery okay it could just have a hefty capacitor system for the srs system so that it can possibly function if all other power is lost somehow these are total guesses we might look into this into the future this might even be topics that i won't look at i'll look into but i don't know if i'll cover it on the channel but i just wanted to tell you that your srs system if you're taking it apart for anything you're doing with the seats or removing yellow connectors a full drain is necessary don't just unplug the battery and right away plug them in and out you do run the very low chance of airbags going off these are words from professional semi-professional yeah they're professional people who said this but then again if you've been around mechanics your whole life you know that they'll tell you what they like to tell you it's two helps and one thing to keep you confused so you go back to them so not dissing anybody, but yeah, that's uh, that. That's what it is. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. There's definitely stuff that I missed, but I plan on continuing this series with random things that I remember over time for the RS4 series to help you guys and myself get the knowledge on, on these things down completely. So thanks for watching. See you in the next video.